The Holy Gospel according to John. Glory, Glory to you. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you a prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, just as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Why then are you baptizing, if neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered, I baptize you with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. And I'll take liberty and read the next sentence. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. Please be seated. Well, good morning, church. Nice to see you. Nice to be back among you. I apologize a little bit for the crackling in my voice. It is either the end of the semester, which is true, or I am really living in context among the people and going through puberty again, just like my students. <laughs> so if it crackles a little bit, sorry about that. Um, I would be remiss, though, if I didn't give you an update to start things off on my dear little friend, my dog, Bear. So Bear has, she's a year and a half now, she has officially graduated from her crate. I don't know if this was our doing or hers, I think it's hers. Uh, for the first year and almost a half, we would put her to bed in her crate at night, and she would sleep there soundly, no problem, and then she'd get up in the morning either by peeping for me or uh, I would have to get her up and take her out. Um, somehow in the last month or so, she's figured out that where she really wants to sleep is really tight next to me. So that has happened. Uh, much to Tammy, my wife's chagrin, I think. Except it was her idea to just put the crate away, because it seems like uh, we're done with that. Uh, make no mistake, uh, Bear loves everybody in the family, is excited to see everyone in the family, and likes meeting new people, is usually a lot of fun to be around. But she's my dog. She's my dog. Uh, she knows who she is. She knows what her purpose is. Um, she knows why she was made, and it's not just because I'm her human. Uh, it's because she knows what she uh, is all about, and as much as she loves to snuggle in, and as much as she wags her tail when I walk in the door, and as much as all the other things that's just fun having a dog take on a walk and stuff, uh, she is about one thing and one thing only, and that is to chase after a ball. Uh, if you have a dog, you might know what this is like. And uh, because she's bare, and I think I messed up when I trained her at the beginning of her life, she won't give the ball back. <laughs> so I have to play with a, a couple of different balls. Sometimes I have five or six of them out there, so I can throw one from one end of the yard to the other, because she'll keep one in her mouth, because that's her purpose. It's to have this ball. Uh, but also to chase after it. So we'll just kind of zigzag back and forth. Um, and also, the other thing about her is to know this, is that uh, you can play ball with her all day. 
She will never tire. But there's one also, uh, one other truth to this, is you could play ball with her, she'd have a great time. My family could play ball with her, she'd have a ball. But it doesn't count until I play. She knows who she is. She knows what her life is about. She knows where she's supposed to point. Now we had uh, done one of those little DNA tests when we first got her, you know, about a year or so ago. And um, she came back, all kinds of things. Uh, part pit, part Staffordshire Terrier, I can't say that very well. Part uh, Australian Shepherd, she will actually gather the balls all in one spot in the yard. Um, if one of us is in the kitchen, she will nudge us until we're all in the same room. So she's definitely part Shepherd. Uh, no, super Mutt, I don't know what that is. Uh, that came on the thing too. Not, said nothing about being a pointer, except the other day when I was out playing ball with her, and uh, Tammy was with me. We were just walking laps in the backyard. Um, she had a ball in her mouth, and she found a ball that she was missing, and she did something I'd never seen her done before. She, she leaned her face forward, she picked her front foot up, her back leg kind of lifted a little bit. Her tail wasn't totally straight, but it was kind of cocked back a little bit, and we looked at her. She's pointing. How cool is that? This is where her life is headed. This is what she's about. This is her purpose. Advent is a time for us to think about that for ourselves. Where are our lives pointed? Where are we going? What are we made to? Who are we made to be? Who are we waiting for? Right? She will sit and uh, look out the window around 3 34 o'clock because she knows. I'll be coming home soon, and she sits there attentively. And then when I come through the threshold, she backs up, lays down, tail a blazing, uh, until I put my stuff away and greet her, and then she comes right for us. Do we know who we're waiting for? What we're waiting for? Where our lives are pointing? What holds us back? The bear also knows what she's not about. She does not like brooms or mops or vacuum cleaners for that matter. Uh, she will let you know that and bark at you. Um, a day like this today, when it's supposed to rain this afternoon, I will not take her for a ride because she thinks it's an abomination to turn on your windshield wipers. <laughs> uh, and to go along with that, uh, mercy on you and your soul should you be outside and open an umbrella. Bad news, she doesn't like that. Um, she looks like a big burly dog. I, I brought her here. I had the kids meet her once. I don't think that went great. Uh, she, she looks big and powerful. She's very muscular, uh, but she's a coward. She once barked for five minutes at a, a bag of leaves because the wind was making it move a little bit. Uh, we have coyotes in my neighborhood, so if we're out, I take her out right when I get up in the morning. So it's like five o'clock in the morning. We're out walking. Uh, if she smells them, uh, you can see the, the hair start to stand up, almost like a mohawk, all the way down her back. Uh, and she doesn't bark, she'll go uh, almost like a horse. <laughs> she doesn't like it, and she'll spin right around and beeline it back to the house. Doesn't want anything to do with a coyote. In fact, one day we were out and we saw one. Um, I don't know if the coyote saw us or not, it was a good enough distance away. But she was huffing and puffing with a hair I've never seen stand up so tight. She ran behind me with the leash through my leg and was shaking, she was so scared. In fact, I had to pick up this 53 pound dog and carry her about a half a mile back home while she's shaking ferociously because she was terrified, looking for uh, protection. But she knows who she is. She knows who her person is. She knows what she's supposed to do. She knows where her life is pointing. Advent, even though it's short this week, reminds us that it's time to kind of get our act together and think about that ourselves. It's a time of uh, anticipation. It's a time of, it's supposed to be a time of, of repentance. It's supposed to be a time to kind of clear out all the things, especially, which is interesting, we get busier and busier and clutter our lives. And yet, standing there is the one who reminds us of these things. This guy named John the Baptist, who knows who he's about, who knows where his life is pointed. He knows what he is supposed to do. He knows he's not the light, but is pointed towards the light. 
He knows he's not the Messiah, a prophet, or anybody else. His job is to make straight the path. His job is to prepare the way of the Lord. We hear a lot about in John the Baptist and Advent in all four Gospels. Things like calling us a brood of vipers. I once thought that would be a fun way to start a sermon. Just, hey everybody, you are a brood of vipers. Wouldn't it be fun? Maybe not for us. But he does that. He calls us to repent. He calls the people down to the river to be baptized. He even baptizes Jesus himself. But when they're wondering, who is this guy? What is he doing? What is he all about? He'll be the first one to tell you, it's not me. My life is pointed in this direction, towards the one who is coming. I'm standing there and looking at the door. My sail's wagging a little bit, but I'm not quite sure yet. He reminds us of what we're supposed to do and what we're supposed to be, what our calling in life is. Now, last weekend, I had my uh, party for my fire department. And as the chaplain, I have one job. While all the kids are running around, and while they're jumping on the bouncy houses, and while they're making crafts, and while they're eating their weight in sugar cookies, it's my job to try to gather them all together, and most of them are under the age of five. Herding sheep, I need bear to get them in line. But to get them all gathered in one spot, and to sit down with them, and to keep them, not hostage, but captive there for five minutes. To read to them, uh, twas the night before Christmas, and to try to get them to somehow stay focused on that story. Because as soon as it's done, uh, you'll hear the siren on the fire engine, and who's stepping out and walking through the door, but Santa himself. Now, I could get all disappointed that everybody totally loses sight of the fact that I was even in the building when this happens. But that's not my purpose. That's not why I'm there. That's not the point. This is what John the Baptist does. He's there to remind us of who's coming, of where our lives should be directed, of the anticipation that is certainly uh, in the air, but when he shows up, the one who is coming, it's also to get out of the way. And John does that as he points and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now we skipped through uh, the first chapter of John in this reading for today. So we hear the parts of John the Baptist, which is good. Uh, but we miss kind of the part in the middle, which is probably the most important part of that whole reading, where we hear that the one who is coming is the word made flesh, the one who has come to live among us, literally to tabernacle with us, to be the presence of God in our very midst. And as we get excited, I mean, hey, it's the 17th of December. Um, Advent is still going a week from now, but let's just be honest with ourselves. Next week, we're going to be thinking about angels and shepherds, and we're going to have, uh, we're going to be thinking about hay, and we're going to be thinking about mangers, and we're going to think about Mary and Joseph, and the child who is coming, and the light that's shining, and all the songs we get to sing, right? I mean, we're going to be pretty excited about it. Um, but what are we supposed to think about is not just cuddly, snuggly little baby Jesus as we sing away in the manger, it's that he is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. And we hear in Isaiah what that's all about, freeing the prisoners, comforting those who are uh, grieving, uh, making those who, who can't see suddenly uh, full of, of sight, proclaiming the, the year of, of the Lord. This is what Jesus is going to do. This is who he is. This is where his life is pointed for you and for me and for the world. <laughs> to be the one who's not only born and in the manger, but who, who grows up, who calls disciples, who reaches out to the outcast and uh, befriends the bereaved and, and heals the broken and the brokenhearted and who suffers and who dies and who 
was raised for you and me and the world. And we're in this place where we're waiting by the window, anticipating, tail wagging maybe slightly because we know it's coming, but not quite. Now I've had the opportunity on three occasions to see one of my favorite pieces of art in person where it actually is. Uh, and I hope to go again sometime. The last time I did it was, I think, 12 years ago. But in the town church called St. Mary's, excuse me, uh, in the old town of Wittenberg where Luther ran the Reformation, there's a church. And in the church, there's an altar. And behind the altar, much, much like how we've got this nice screen here and the cross and all that, there's a huge altarpiece. It's massive. In a way that you don't quite see it when you're looking at the page in a book or if you're looking at it on the screen uh, that quite captures it. I remember the first time I walked into the nave, the sanctuary there, and actually saw it in person, thought to myself, wow, it's quite striking. There's four panels uh, in this particular altarpiece. It was designed and painted by a guy named Lucas Chronic the Elder. He had a son named Lucas Chronic the Younger. Uh, this one was done by Dad. Um, he was a friend of Luther's, actually, and he made this altarpiece a year after Luther had died. It was 1547. It sat there upon that altar in that church ever since. There's four pieces to it, and it reminds us not only of our, our Reformation history and theology, but it's also a reminder, I think, if we think about it during this time of Advent, where we're supposed to be pointing. Why are we here? What our lives are all about. Who it is we're waiting for. There in that center panel, which is at least three times bigger than the rest. It looks like a dinner scene. It's supposed to be kind of like the Last Supper, I think. It's everybody uh, sharing the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, together. It's set in a contemporary setting, so everybody in this painting looks like they're from the 16th century. It's like if I took a snapshot of you all today and put it up on the altar behind me. But there, reaching around the table, is Luther himself. He's in his disguise back when he was Junker York, or Knight George, when they hid him in a castle, because his friends and he were afraid that people were going to come after him and kill him. And he was up there translating the Bible into German, so people like us could get a hold of the scriptures. But he's reaching, almost in uh, full desperation, if not trust, to the one who's handing him the cup, the blood of Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And there on the left-hand panel, uh, left to you, right to me, is a baptism scene. And the font is pretty big. And the people are all kind of gathered beneath. And the family is all gathered around the front. And a couple of Luther's buddies, Philip Melanchthon and Johannes Bubenhagen, are up there running the baptism. And there's a, a baby coming out of the water who's naked and dripping wet. And the artist even put himself in the painting because he's standing there. He's either got a, a robe or a towel or something to to wrap up this child, and we're reminded of that gift in our lives, that we are part of the body of Christ, that the old self in us is put to death, and new life is raised up in us, in our life of Christ, and that nothing can separate us, nothing, uh, from the love of God in Christ Jesus uh, for you and me, and you see it right there in that picture. And then on the, the right-hand side, uh, my left, your right over here. Uh, something that's a little bit strange to us. It's a scene of uh, confession and forgiveness. And the local pastor there, uh, Johannes Bugenhagen, is sitting on a chair. And there's two gods in front of him. And I've always been told that what it's supposed to show is uh, one guy is confessing his sins because he's on his knees. Uh, and the other guy looks like he's running away and doesn't want to be there at all. Um, but what I've come to kind of maybe think about, especially in a contemporary setting, is maybe what uh, Bugenhagen is doing here, maybe what he's showing us we can be in our life of the church, is he's, he's mediating. He's bringing these two people together. 
We think of our broken, painful world that full of so much suffering and destruction all the time. We feel so incredibly helpless as to what to do about it or how to even be engaged. And where is the church right in that place? It's, it's bringing people together. We, we think about uh, Christ coming as, as the Prince of, of Peace. And it's not just the end of hostility. It's actually mending broken lives and bringing people together. Isn't that a great image for who we could be as Christ's people in the world? But my favorite part of this whole piece of artwork is right above the altar itself, and it's the smallest little panel. You can see it from the back, but you almost have to get a little closer. It kind of invites you in to take a peek at what's going on there. Uh, because it's, it's much more stark than the other pieces, uh, much less color. In fact, you might even overlook it, but I think it speaks so boldly. There in the center, all by itself, with nothing else, much like uh, the altar behind me, is the cross. It's just there, right in the middle of our lives. And in this particular piece, it's Jesus hanging on the cross, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And there on this side, looking at the cross, is the congregation. And they're all looking at it intently. And in fact, maybe in an endearing way, the artist put Luther's family right in the first couple of pews. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? To keep the cross focused in our lives, to be waiting, certainly, for him to come, to know that there's joy coming, to anticipate, yes, to point, maybe start to raise our hand and foot just a little. And yet, isn't that the center of who we are and who we're called to be? Because there on the other side, where your pulpit is, is also a big pulpit with Luther himself standing in it. Luther, who wrote uh, the 95 Theses, which we know, and the small catechism, which a lot of us had to study in catechism class, Confirmation, and we still pass on from generation to generation. We wrote those great Reformation hymns we'd like to sing uh, come October. Who, in the words of my mentor and friend, Pastor Bill Carter, uh, said of Luther, never an unpublished thought. He was the master of the medium at the time. In fact, if you went out and tried to buy yourself Luther's works in English, it's 55 volumes. Most of them are a couple inches thick. And that's just what was translated into English. You could get a ton of stuff. But in this picture, he's not saying anything. Not a word. Not a word or hope of promise. Not a word that makes you cringe a little bit and makes you wonder. Nothing. All he's doing is one thing. Point. Pointing to the cross. So that all his hearers on the other side will be focused right there on who they are, on who they're called to be, on who it is we're waiting for, on who we've got our wet noses pressed against the glass, hoping arrives soon. But when he shows up, we start to, to, to wiggle around and, and move our butts because, you know, we don't have to. We know when he enters doesn't come with, with judgment and condemnation, but comes with life, with, with forgiveness, who makes all things new. Because when this Jesus arrives, and will be arriving oh so ever shortly, our lives will be made exceptionally clear. Because there's one reason why we're here, in the joy of the one who's coming. Here to play. Advent blessings to you, and Merry Christmas a week early. Amen.